Awesome. Well, my name is Tom Patterson. I'm the founder and CEO of Tommy John. Quick raise of hands, be honest, before you knew I was coming here, how many have heard of the company? For reference, okay. That's, that's good. How many are wearing Tommy John underwear? Wow. Okay. 70% is family, so th that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> well, uh, for me, it's an honor to be here today. You know, when Barb, just for those who are on social media, if you guys want to plug in, being the age of social media, feel free to right now. But for me, uh, you know, a year ago, Barb reached out to me, and I think she had read a story about Tommy John in a textbook and called and asked, and I, I wasn't able to do the event, but I said I definitely wanted to do it next year, preferably during hunting season, which I didn't tell her, but I was able to get a hunt in on Saturday. And uh, so it's, it's, it's an honor, you know, I, some of my greatest memories growing up in Melbank were coming to Hobo Days and going to a lot of football and basketball games with my grandparents. And it's, it's exciting to come back and see how much it's changed, you know, in the last, gosh, 17 years. I think, right? 17 or 18 since we graduated high school. So uh, really cool to be here. You know, and I just want to thank a lot of people. I know you guys drove, you know, I think two and a half hours from Aberdeen and, you know, getting babysitters for your kids. So really nice to see a lot of familiar faces here in the crowd. So today, you know, <clears throat> like Craig mentioned, I'm going to talk about my story, how I got into Tommy John and making men's underwear of all things, which I never thought I'd do in a million years. So I'm going to start out telling my story. So I started from small beginnings, and I show this slide to a lot of people when I do presentations, you know, whether it's private equity groups or venture capital groups, because they, no matter where I go and how many times I tell them, they always say, oh, you're from North Dakota, after I tell them South Dakota. And I put this slide up to see who's actually paying attention at the end of the day. <laughs> So, my, my beginning is, who in, the, who in the audience has seen the movie uh, My Girl with Dan Aykroyd and Macaulay Culkin when he got stung by a bee, or the HBO series Six Feet Under? So I grew up in a, 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 a home that was connected to a funeral home, a third generation business in, in Melbank, South Dakota, about 70 miles from here. and really came from a, a bloodline of entrepreneurs. My great-grandpa started this business in 1889, and my parents took over the business shortly after. And, you know, the early years, I want to cover really four important things to me. It's, you know, family, school, sports, and work, and kind of give you the meaning behind that. So uh, my mom is one of five. My dad is one of six. Had big families growing up. Uh, family is obviously very important to me. <clears throat> and, you know, one of my biggest influences in life and being an entrepreneur is my grandpa. You know, he started a lot of businesses. He was very active in the community. I absorbed and went with him, spent a lot of my childhood with him. Uh, so without him, I, I, I'm not sure if I would have ever had the idea to start Tommy John's. So a lot of things, you know, that are really important to me were inspired from my grandpa. And school obviously was an important part um, growing up, sports and work. And I think sports, is interesting because I played sports growing up, football and basketball and running track, uh, playing baseball, but I was always very competitive. I think I was always wired very differently. My mom tells this story when I was a little kid when we would get passed by cars on the four lane or on the freeway, I would get so upset. I'd be like, mom, mom, we're getting beat, we're getting beat. Speed up, speed up. And I wouldn't talk to her for the rest of the day because I was so upset that we got passed on the way home. So if, for whatever reason, I've always been very competitive and I think, you know, I think any entrepreneur deep down is probably deeply competitive and, and hates to lose and always wants to figure out creative ways to win. So I think sports and you know, working with teams and you know, setting goals and being able to execute and achieve goals and overcoming challenges <clears throat> and, and working with different personalities and understanding what motivates and in, inspires and gets other people to work harder um, have been a big part of my background and I think you know, the older you get as you start your own business, a lot of those traits you look back on in your childhood, you know, sometimes you wish you would have paid a little more attention because now, you know, you have a company and it's, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to, you know, the, the things I learned in sports and then work. So I always had a roof over my head. I always had food to eat, uh, but I always worked. You know, I was never really given anything handed to me. My parents would. Uh, I had lawn mowing businesses in the summer. I'd wake up at six or seven in the morning before school, 
and I would shovel sidewalks, I would snow blow. Uh, I was a sandwich engineer, I called it, at Subway for a couple summers. I'd paint houses, I would drive a funeral coach during funerals, I would deliver flowers. So I was always wanting to make money and you know, do, do things business related. And then, <clears throat> and, and that's really the, the point about work. So post high school, I went to Arizona State. I graduated with a business communications degree in 2002. And my junior year of college, I met a guy at a dinner and he was in medical device sales. And I really didn't know what I was gonna do. I thought I'd go to college and figure it out, figure it out on the way. And told me about this business and you know, you're working with doctors and surgeons and you have the opportunity to make a lot of money and travel and you get a company car. I'm like, gosh, that sounds pretty good. What do I have to do to get in that? He said, well, you should go work for a business to business company, get business to business B2B selling skills. So I worked for a company called Airborne Express, which is now DHL and they're a competitor with UPS and FedEx. So my first two years was in Minneapolis and it was probably the hardest job I ever had. I would make about one to 200 cold calls on the phone every day trying to get to decision makers and figuring out creative ways to get to the person that made the shipping decision or the warehousing and logistics decision. And I did that for two years. And the medical device sales guy who I had dinner with said, go do it for two years, show that you're successful, try to be in the top 20 or 25 if you can, win some awards. And once you do that, you're gonna be more lucrative and a medical company will want to hire you. So I did that for two years, and I moved out to San Diego, and I slept on my uncle's couch, who's a firefighter out there, and two weeks later, I got into medical sales, and I worked for a company called Covidian. Has anyone heard of Covidian or Tyco Healthcare in the crowd? Okay, so if you ever go to the hospital, they put a sensor on your finger with a red light, looks like ET, you know what that is. It's called a pulse oximeter, and it measures your oxygen saturation levels and your heart rate. So I sold the pulse oximeters to hospitals and doctors and surgeons. And I think, and I did that for four or five years, four, four and a half years, enjoyed it, I was successful in it, liked it, never loved it. And uh, about four and a half years into it, I'd wear a suit and tie every day. I always wore an undershirt. And I started watching this TV show called The Big Idea on MSNBC. Has anyone seen that? It was about 2007, uh, Donnie Deutsch was an entrepreneur. Uh, it was on for about a year and a half, and th the whole premise of the show, I guess maybe it was the, the previous version of, for, of Shark Tank, where they would have entrepreneurs come on the show, and they would talk about their ideas, and how do you, once you have an idea, how do you make packaging? How do you reach a buyer? How do you find a manufacturer? And I was fascinated because there were all the questions that I had always wondered how these people did it, because typically you read, X, you know, this guy started a company, he sold it for this, and he retired, well, how did he do it? That's awesome, he did it, but how do you do it? And it was fascinating, but the whole premise of the show was every inventor or entrepreneur had created a product because they didn't like what, what, what they could find on the market. And uh, this is the show, Don, the big idea of Donnie Deutsch. Um, and they thought, maybe there's a better way to make something. So I would wake up every morning and I think, gosh, how do I make a better coffee cup? How do I make a better door handle? How do I make a better pen? It was literally anything I was trying to figure out. And I thought, you know, when I went to college, my parents said, go to college, get a degree, build a 401k, build a retirement savings. And I, I thought, that's great, but I always wanted to start my own business. And I thought maybe someday an idea would come to me, but I'll use corporate America to learn the foundation of running a business. And when you're in sales, you have your own territory. And you understand that your territory is really your own business. So I did that thinking, all right, maybe something will come to me. Maybe something will come to me, whether I'm 28 when it did, or when I'm 40 or 50, I didn't really care. And I get out of my car doing a presentation at a hospital and you know, I was tailoring my dress shirts and you know, tailoring my suiting and all of a sudden, everything's tucked in and my undershirt's up to here, like a midriff, up by, up by my belly button. And I'm thinking, why in the hell can't anyone make an undershirt that doesn't shrink, doesn't bunch up, doesn't yellow, doesn't get the bacon neck, doesn't constantly come untucked, because I would have to go to the hospital inside the bathroom and retuck in my undershirt every time. It was a big pain for me. So I thought, gosh, maybe, maybe there, there's a better undershirt. So, I started going to department stores like Nordstrom and Macy's and Bloomingdale's after my presentation. 
and I laid out all the undershirts from Calvin Klein and Hugo Boss and Jockey, and they were all designed the same. They all had a good-looking model in the box. They're all more often made in three countries, and the only difference was the brand or the label on the outside. And I thought, gosh, this is really weird. It's, it's, and I thought, so I go up to the salesperson. I said, do you have an undershirt that's longer and fitted that stays tucked in? And he said, no, but if you find one, let us know next time you come back here. And I thought, gosh, that's really weird. I thought you guys were the experts. So I drove up to downtown Los Angeles to the garment district. And I'll show you this slide. So those of you that are familiar, is most undershirts on the market are baggy and they're boxy, like the one here on the left. And the way Tommy John works is it's longer, it has a tapered design, it doesn't shrink, it has multi-directional stretch fabric. So once it's put on, it sits past the guy's butt, he can put his arms up, he can put luggage on an airplane, it never comes untucked. It's not Spanx for men. Unless you look like the guy in the after image, we don't recommend you wear it in the public on Friday nights with a pair of jeans. It's meant to be worn under shirts, under suits. And at the time, I started realizing, gosh, I wear this every day. I hate my day because I constantly have to readjust myself. So I went up to the garment district in downtown Los Angeles. Has anyone been there to the garment district in downtown Los Angeles? Okay, so you know it's a crazy place. There's rug manufacturers, there's jewelry, there's fabric people that have rolls of fabric and rugs. So I started going into these, uh, these factory places, this, these fabric stores, and touching and feeling fabric, and I bought a roll of fabric, and I, I took it to a tailor at a dry cleaners that lived a couple blocks from where I lived. At the time, I was living in San Diego, and I was never a good art student, probably the worst drawer in my, in my class. And actually, believe it or not, this is probably the 100th iteration of my first sketch. <laughs> and my wife helped me out with the measurements. But I, I applied my second grade art skills, and I designed an undershirt based off a t-shirt that I liked. And I wanted it to be, fit me true to size in the chest, to be longer. And I thought with the stretch fabric, maybe it will stay tucked in. And I went to the dry cleaners, and the lady said, why would you want to waste all this beautiful fabric and make a shirt that's going to go down to your knees? I said, I'd, I'm just into some really weird stuff. Don't, don't worry about it. I'll come back and pay for it. <laughs> and this, this part on the top of a t-shirt is called ribbing, for guys that don't know. And uh, the tailor said, do you have ribbing for the undershirts? And I said, I don't, no, I don't think so. I don't know what that is. So we had to go to an arts and crafts store. I couldn't find the picture, but the very first Tommy John had Donald Duck printed ribbing on it, because I couldn't find anything else that would work. So I came back a week later, I put the undershirt on, I couldn't get it to come untucked, and I was like, yes, this worked. So, and I figured, you know, worst case scenario, it's $100, it's dinner for two in New York, I'm out 100 bucks. And the idea worked, so I made 15 more undershirts, and I sent them out to friends of mine, guys that wore suits and ties, friends of mine, people that I worked with, people that I trusted, that would give me honest feedback and most of the guys call back a week later. And these are ty the type of guys that would say, Tom, this is an incredible idea, or Tom, is everything all right? Are you sure you want to do this? This is a really bad idea. So I knew I'd get great feedback, or bad feedback. And they all call back and said, hey, if you ever make more of these, let me know, and I'll come back and I, I'll buy 10 or 15 of them. So I went back up to downtown Los Angeles, to this area, without a map, and I started knocking, going on different doors. I said, do you know where I can have some t-shirts made? Do you know where I can have some t-shirts made? Finally, the 10th store I walked into, the guy said, hold on, and he made a call, and he's like, Max, I have this young man, he wants to make some t-shirts, can you do it for him? He said, he wrote down the directions, and I went to the downtown Chinatown in downtown Los Angeles to a facility that had steel bars on the windows, some big dogs outside. Walked in, look left, look right, a few seconds later, I realized it was a sweatshop, and <laughs> cash only, and no receipts, and I, I didn't know where else to make them. So I, the guy, first question he asked me is, do you have your markers and grading? I said, I might have a marker in my car, maybe. I didn't know what it was. So markers and grading are the patterns from, from small, medium, large, extra large, double extra large, and how they grade wider and longer and s sleeve lengths. and next sizes get bigger to adjust to different sizes of men. And 
I came back uh, a week later, paid the guy, and the first couple hundred undershirts weren't designed like a V-shaped design. They were designed like a, like a V-shape, and then they went out like a Goodyear blimp, and then they went down. So what I realized is we had cut the shirts incorrectly in the bias, and it was a really costly mistake. You know, f for me at the time, it was $1,500. And you know, it may not be a lot of money to a lot of people, but I think it was a really turning point for me because I needed to you know, make the commitment to start you know, the 10,000 hour rule. And I think they say people become experts once they apply 10,000 10, hours to what they're working on. And I had no experience in this industry. I had no connections. I really knew nothing other than I didn't like my undershirts. So I worked on the grading and the size ratios, and I came back a week later, and the undershirts were, correctly, were correct, and I started selling them online. I built a two-page PayPal checkout website in April of 2008, and uh, <clears throat> started selling them. And, and I would give them to friends of mine, and I would ask my friends to give them to other friends of theirs because they're a credible re reference, they knew how the product worked, and that's really how we started by word of mouth and friends of mine feeling sorry for me starting this t-shirt company and they wanted to support me. So what we really focused on, and I think the best analogy I can give you guys for Tommy John is if you took three brands that I admire, uh, if you took Nike or Under Armour for performance and you took Calvin Klein or Ralph Lauren for fashion and you took Apple for iPhones or technology, and you were able to have all three of those companies somehow conceive a baby, the baby's name would be Tommy John. And, and what I mean by that is there are certain parts of those businesses that I really admire, performance and fashion and technology, and there's really three things that make Tommy John unique and different on the market, and we call them the three Fs. And one is fabric, you know, we break from from tradition and we use innovative materials that, that don't shrink, that keep you cooler, that don't turn yellow as quickly, that don't stretch out, and they'll last two to three times longer than a traditional product on the market. The third thing is fit. We have innovative designs where all of our products solve a problem. Our undershirts never come untucked. Our underwear doesn't ride up your legs. We have a no wedgie guarantee. Our socks, once you put them on, they never fall down. So there's a solution to a problem that we feel is on the market that not a lot of men talk about. And once they put our products on, um, they typically switch over. And then that really comes down to the functionality, which is the solution. And these are the three ingredients that have really made us different and unique to the market and allowed us to, in a way, become a challenger brand in the men's underwear market. <coughs> so um, ended up making these shirts, and this is in April 2008, like I talked about. Fast forward six months in the fall of 08, I was laid off my medical sales job uh, the end of September, about seven years ago, and I read this, comp this article in the news that there's no better time to start a business than during a recession. If you guys remember the fall of 2008, which a lot of these students were maybe in junior high or, or younger, so I'm assuming they didn't watch the news like the older people in the audience do. Um, that was when the whole mortgage crisis and financial and retail recession began, and I, and I thought there's no time to better start a, to, there's no better time to start a business than during a recession. So I did everything that you're not supposed to do, or at least I was taught to do in schools. I cashed out my 401k, I, I cashed out my savings, I used my friends at American Express, Visa, and Mastercard to start financing, making underwear and undershirts, and <coughs> I thought. My whole thing was I didn't want to have regrets. I had this idea. I'd been doing it six months before. I was laid off my job. And I thought, gosh, I don't want to think back 20 years from now and be like, God, I coulda, I shoulda, I woulda. I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. I didn't own a home. For me, I, when I looked at it, you know, kind of the pros and cons, I thought, gosh, there's really no better time for me to do it, regardless of it being in a recession. So I kind of took that leap of faith, and I started doing this full time applying 100% of my time, and uh, we ended up doing the magic show in Las Vegas on a weekend, and the magic show is, it's, it's kind of the Super Bowl of fashion. A lot of the brands go there from, from Nike to Levi's to Ralph Lauren, and they have booths where retail buyers come, and they come see your product, and at the time, <coughs> you know, we were uh, very excited to do this. We had black and white pack packaging that was shot. A friend of mine did it on a roof in San Diego uh, for 500 bucks. 
I actually had to do the modeling, believe it or not, because we were too poor to hire a real model. And we did this show in Las Vegas, and we had all these vinyl made. We had made these shirts in a factory in Los Angeles. And the first day, we were all set up. This is my wife, Erin, who was my girlfriend at the time. We were so excited. I mean, this, this show was a $10,000 investment after you pay the fee to enter into the show, after you rent a hotel, you drive there, you have all these things made, you buy mannequins. And first day, so excited. And then the second and third day, it's crickets. No one's stopping by. No one's ever heard of us. Who or why would anyone want to buy an undershirt like that that's so long and it looks like a dress? Who are you again? How long have you been in business? <laughs> our, you know, our business address was a P.O. box. And I remember after this, you know, we, was, we were driving home from Las Vegas to San Diego, and I was so disappointed because we had only done about $2,000 in sales at this event, and I had just lost $8,000. And I'm scratching my head. I'm like, God, what? I don't know why, if I should do this, how am I going to recover? So what ended up happening is we went back, and I thought, all right, I need to buckle down and really start applying myself. So we, we moved from San Diego to Phoenix, where my wife lived. And we had global headquarters there in her, in her two-bedroom condo in, in Phoenix. And all of our inventory we brought with, and I went up to Los Angeles one time, and I got all this inventory, and I said, don't worry, we're going to sell it. It's not that much. And she's like, well, how much is it? And it's like a car load. It was a trailer behind the car, which I didn't tell her. And I, I didn't really realize I didn't have a, the correct reference for space. So this was our warehouse <laughs> in Phoenix, Arizona. The whole living room, that's my dog Marley, uh, was set up. And that's my wife laying among all the clothes at the time. Uh, so we worked in Phoenix, Arizona from, from uh, about January of 2009 to April. And I was able to get a meeting with a Nima Marcus buyer. Who's all, who knows who Nima Marcus is? OK. So for those of you that don't, Nima Marcus is a major department store in the United States. It's a very premium, upscale retailer. They have about 42 stores across the country. And I had scheduled a meeting with them in April. I called the buyer and said I was going to be in Dallas, Texas, which is where they're headquartered, which I wasn't going to be in Dallas, but I told her I was going to be. And I said, I'd like to meet with you. She said, great, what days are you going to be here? And I told her. And I said, before I meet with you, I want to send undershirts to your husband and all the men in the office. Because I, I felt that she, as a woman, wouldn't, really wouldn't understand the challenges that guys have with their undershirts and how they fit. Because I know most men don't go home at the end of the day and say, honey, I was at work today. My undershirt bunched up. And I had to retuck it into my underwear. And it was just drove me crazy. Guys don't talk about that stuff, right? So women oftentimes don't know that this problem exists. So she agreed. She let me send undersh undershirts to uh, her husband and all the other guys. But before that, something actually really important happened to me. So before I was able to get the meeting with the Neiman Marcus buyer, I had flown out to New York and I met with Bloomingdale's. And they had told me that 65% of men's underwear is bought by women. So the women in the audience, how many of you have bought underwear for a guy before? Not 65%. <laughs> It's actually gone down. Uh, but in 2008, 65% of men's underwear was bought by women. So when we were, I knew for us to be successful in a retail department store setting, we really needed to stand out because no one knew who Tommy John was. They thought I was the baseball pitcher or the son of a baseball pitcher. Just for the record, there's no relation. My middle name is John. A lot of friends call me Tommy. I think the only thing we're pitching is better fitting underwear. Um, but I knew we needed to stand out, so we redid our packaging, and we did, a, uh, we did a survey, and we found that women really like two things. They like Tiffany's jewelry and chocolate. And I thought, wow, okay. What if we make packaging that's similar to Tiffany's blue and chocolate? So we had chocolate brown, which I don't think you can see the brown here very well, and Tiffany's blue, and I, we felt that women shopping in a retail environment would be attracted visually to that product, not because they were craving chocolate or jewelry, but you know, we also tried to pick a good-looking guy to be the model at the time. And we redeveloped our packaging based on Bloomingdale's, which we never got into. We're actually launching into Bloomingdale's in February. But it took us 
that was a really great conversation. I think what it goes to show, and I think for the entrepreneurs, is you can always learn, and you can learn from anyone. And I think I always say no means not yet. And I think you can always learn from that situation. And that was probably one of the best pieces of advice I had ever got is understanding that statistic about how many women bought men's underwear at the time. So what I, what I learned in hindsight is I went to meet with Nima Marcus, and I had this big presentation, big PowerPoint, and I went through it, and she said, that's great. But and I, in the presentation, I said, my goal is I want to be launched into three stores, and I want to prove to you that Tommy John could be six, the most successful brand here. She goes, that's great. I think maybe you can, but we're not going to put you in three stores. We're actually going to put you in 15 stores in August. And I was like, that's pretty awesome. I'll take that. And I said, and she, she goes, every day for the last two weeks, every guy has been coming in here saying how awesome this undershirt is. Why don't you have it in this store? So they've been barking at me so much that we're just going to bring you in and do it. But the final decision maker felt packaging was really important. And we ultimately ended up getting the opportunity to be tested in Nima Marcus because of the chocolate brown and Tiffany's blue packaging that we use in the retail environment. So at that time, as I said, we were living in Phoenix, Arizona. We got the order to go into Neiman Marcus, so we moved on about two weeks' notice. We looked to Los Angeles because we were making everything in downtown Los Angeles. My wife at the time was doing software sales for a company called Oracle, and we picked up, moved, moved to Los Angeles in a small 500-square-foot studio. And all of our manufacturing was still done in Chinatown at the time. We were a one-person company. My m wife maybe helped me 10% of the time. And <clears throat> the reason we went there is to oversee a lot of the manufacturing, the quality control, the packaging, the stickering, a lot of things that you don't pay attention to in the retail store until you start doing this for what would hopefully become a living. And we, this was in uh, May of 2009, and we launched it in Nima Marcus in August. And I remember in end of May, my sister, my sister Mary sent me an article from Women's Wear Daily, and there was a retail workshop in Orange County, California, and it was going to be held, it was a big event, and there were some retail experts there that talked about launching into a department store, operating cash flow, understanding margin, I thought, gosh, I'll pay 100 bucks. Worst, worst thing is I learned a few things about it, and I went in, and um, a guy who was running the, the show um, was one of the speakers uh, right before lunch and said, hey, can I have lunch with you? I had a few questions. I'll, be, I'll pay for lunch. I, I just want to learn. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. We're, we're too busy. Uh, maybe tomorrow. And then at the end of the day, it was a two-day conference. Before he left, I said, here, take this undershirt. Wear it tomorrow and let me know what you think. And if you like it, maybe we can work together. Because I felt for some reason I could learn so much from this guy. And his name's Dana Freed. He's a fashion guru. He lives in Los Angeles. And he had worked for, with a lot of successful entrepreneurs when they launched into department stores, which I was about to do in two months. So he tells a story. He came back the next day, and he wasn't going to wear it. And he was living with his 85-year-old mother. And right before he walked out the door, she goes, Dana, Dana, come back and put that young man's undershirt on. And he's like, oh, Mom, fine, I'll put it on. And he put on the undershirt. And he tells a story a little bit better than I did. He put it on, and he thought, wow, this is unlike anything I've ever worn. I want to talk to this guy. So he came back into the second day of the show, and he grabbed me aside. He's like, hey, I want to talk to you. I think you have something here. Let's have lunch. And we had lunch, and he tells, tells me he's about $1,500 a day. I'm like, dude, I don't have $1,500 a month right now. There's no way I can afford to pay for you. I said, I can trade you in underwear and maybe like IOUs or promissory notes. And for whatever reason, he saw something in me and the company and the idea and probably felt sorry for me at the same time. And he started working with me and he st started teaching me about cash flow and margin and how to leverage inventory and understand what factoring is and introducing me to factors and, and introducing me to manufacturers because he had connections to overseas manufacturers and packaging suppliers. And I knew, I just felt for some reason he could. So that was a really interesting uh, turning point. And he's, he's my most trusted advisor today. He's one of my best friends, uh, still lives in Los Angeles. He sits on our board at Tommy John. And this is our LA headquarters. And we've got some packaging. And we were sending out some influencer packaging uh, <coughs> uh, here in the apartment. And I think, you know, in uh, August of 2009, we launched into Nima Marcus. And what we ended up doing 
forward, forward through here a little bit, is um, I went out to Neiman Marcus stores. The first month we sold 60% of our inventory, which at the time was a record for Neiman Marcus. But the way I did it is I went to all 15 stores and I would spend time in the store all day Saturday and all day Sunday. And I would do product knowledge events and speak in front of all the employees in a store like this and tell them about who I am and why my product's so great. But I would spend time on the floor and talk to customers and grab them shirts to try on and started getting feedback and understood what the best way to position my product amongst our competitors was, but also sell it to those guys. And obviously you can see Tim Tebow was really popular at that time, so you can see us doing Tebowing events at, at some of the stores. But Monday through Friday, I would be sitting in these factories in Los Angeles with dust around them, rats running across fabric rolls. It, it, it was far from this glamorous life of runway shows and fashion events that I think I had a stereotype on before I got into this industry. And we slowly grew. And we had such a record sell through at Neiman Marcus, they decided to put us in all 42 stores on something called weekly replenishment where you ship to them each week. And I remember they said, are you on EDI or are you factored? And I'm like, I, I don't think so. I don't know what that is. Well, EDI is a technology that allows them to tra transfer electronic orders to you, which we figured out. And factoring is a way to finance credit and apply it against a purchase order. So <clears throat> you have more cash flow to, to run and operate your business. So we started figuring out on how, on how to use factors. And from there, you know, we slowly grew. We grew from Nima Marcus, and then I went to Nordstrom and said, let me prove to you that I can replicate this formula in five of your stores. And we grew from five to 10 to 20 to 100 stores at, at Nordstrom. And we were kind of off, and that was our opportunity, or that was our shot, so to say, to kind of get into this industry. And the first year um, we were making, the first year and a half after we launched into Neiman Marcus, we went, I went to 98 Nordstrom stores, and I went to 40 Neiman Marcus stores. People thought I worked for the companies. I was there so often. And my, I think I had it on the previous slide. Um, Planes, rental cars, and Priceline.com is how I did it with my friends at American Express, Visa, and, and MasterCard. But I um, lost my place there. Um, but we did that, and I think I didn't realize how much work it was at the time renting cars and booking travel and standing on your feet for 12 hours a day on a Saturday and Sunday. But I think what, what, what was one of the things that has really helped us be successful is there was no part of my business that I didn't understand. I had understood sewing and packaging and EDI. And cus you know when you would call our 1-800 number, I would answer it, Tommy John, this is Chris. So I could create a barrier between Chris and myself, the founder, so I could blame everything on him if there was a mistake. And, you know, they always say fake it till you make it. There were some things that you had to do. And when we launched into Neiman Marcus stores, I would pick up the phone and call other stores. And I said, do you have Tommy John there? Oh, no, we don't have it. I said, well, I was in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and I would want to come in there. And then the buyer would say, hey, we heard that this store wants your product. Can we put it in that store? And I knew that they would want it, but they didn't know that they wanted it yet. So, so you had to get really creative, and I had read people and entrepreneurs do this in other businesses, whether it was consumer goods or electronics. So I was applying those types of strategies into my underwear, and it was a way for us to grow faster, and we would certainly support it. So fast forward, uh, September of 2010, we launched into 110 Nordstrom stores, and we decided to move the business to New York City. Being an underwear brand, for me, I didn't think California was a place I really wanted to be anymore because California skate and surfing is really big, or outdoor, out, the outdoor brands do really well, and we weren't really a celebrity-driven brand, and I felt New York would be a place that we could attract more talent because New York is really the fashion capital of the world. Uh, two, there's more retail buyers that go through New York City than any other city in the world. And three, I felt that you know, in order to grow and network, and be around and within what I think are the smartest, most ambitious people in the world in, in a very concentrated area, I felt I could learn so much so quickly. And I, I, for me, I kind of like that challenge of being put in uncomfortable places. In New York, you know, it's very easy to boomerang back to where you came from. So I kind of, that was really the test I wanted to, you know, put us against. So, we packed up everything. We started manufacturing our product in China at the time. 
and we put everything in a, 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 a pod. It basically packs everything and it ships two weeks later. So we moved to New York City and this is our office for two weeks because our stuff was two weeks late. So we, we had a blow up mattress that came the day before. I think I was probably calling upset about the transportation company and wondering where they were. And we set up world headquarters about eight feet from our bedroom in New York City in October of 2010. And that's where Tommy John customer service was. It was where our design department was. It was where sales and manufacturing was. I sat right here. My wife sat right there. And my dog is probably right there. So we're in all these great stores like Neiman Marcus and Nordstrom. And friends and family are calling, oh, wow, you guys must be making millions of dollars. Are you thinking about retiring yet? Have you bought a house? How many cars do you own? And I'm like, man, you guys have no idea. You should come visit us and see where we're living. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, when you're an entrepreneur for, for you know, Craig and the guys I had dinner with tonight, I think you, you don't really understand until you're in that position. And it's not as easy as you think. And I always get asked the question, would you do this again if you had known what you did? In hindsight, and I probably second guessed it a little bit, but I'd still do it, but I had no idea how hard it was going to be. And for us, you know, we started growing, and <clears throat> this is our office, you know, my wife and my dog, and we did everything here for the first year, and um, we ended up hiring our first employee in September 2011, and moved into our first office in the Flatiron District in New York City um, on, on 20th and 5th, who, who, who knew, 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 who know New York City very well, and we grew from two to 15 people, uh, through March 2014. And what happened is something really interesting. This is actually our employees right before we moved into our first office doing office jousting because we had so much room on chairs. It's probably an HR violation, which we couldn't get away with today. But I always say, you know, luck, luck finds you when you're ready. And has anyone heard, heard of Howard Stern talking about our underwear that's in the crowd? Okay, okay. So. Uh, we were working with an agency here in, in New York City, and I remember in January 2010, I, I started, or sorry, January 2014, I started getting phone calls and emails. I'm in a meeting, I get out, and I think Kevin, you'd send me a message, and they're like, hey, Howard Stern just talked about Tommy John. You, they want a representative from Tommy John to call in. He has a question about the fabric, and I'm thinking, yeah, right, you guys are not, you guys are joking, there's no way. And an agency had sent him a pair of underwear. I didn't even know he received it. And Howard ended up talking about his underwear, about it changed his life, and he can't imagine his life without this type of underwear. He doesn't get a wedgie with it. It doesn't ride up. And if you would put a list of 100 people we would want to wear Tommy John at the time, I'll be honest, he wouldn't have been on the top 100 list. <laughs> and I think for us, you know, I think a woman's brand the way that they look at Oprah as being very influential. He is kind of the Oprah version to us. And what had happened is we had our best sales day online on our website. And then he ended up talking about it again in February and we had our best day again. And there are these big peaks and big peak again. And then in March, um, in March of 2014, I get a phone call from XM Radio and they said, Howard Stern won't, st won't stop talking about your underwear. In 20 years, we've never heard him talk about a company so much that's not a paid advertiser. Would you have any interest in advertising? And I thought, gosh, let me think about it. How much is it, by the way? And they said, well, it's about, I think it was $62,000 to advertise for one month. And at the time, our monthly advertising marketing budget was about 30,000. I said, well, let me get back to you. And I wanted to go back and look at the data and see how often those customers who have bought during those two peaks, how many of them had came back and bought again. And over 50% of them had came back and bought again. And they didn't buy one or two pairs, they would come back and buy 10 or 20 pairs of underwear and undershirts. And I'm gonna see if I can get this to play. No, okay. Not gonna be able to get it to play. Um, but he ended up talking about our underwear again. And so I talked to our team and I said, look, being that I don't want to have any regrets, and I don't want to be a coulda, woulda, shoulda guy 20 years from now, I think we should do it. And they're like, oh, I don't know, that's two months worth of budget, and I said, we're doing it. It's, we can't not do it. So we ended up advertising in Howard Stern on March 31st of 2014, and 
he ended up talking about, he's like, I'm so happy Tommy John is advertising. You know how much I love this underwear. It's completely changed my life. Long story short, we paid for the entire one month of advertising in the first 24 hours. And 40 days later, we ended up going through five months of inventory, and which caused a lot of this. We were out of stock. And it's kind of like you're driving through a green light, listening to music, and all of a sudden you get T-boned. And you don't even see where they're coming from. You don't even see it coming. There's no way you can really plan for it. You can't prepare for it. You can only dream about it, but it happens. So up until the pre-Howard Stern advertising, we had 99% of our inventory in stock. 40 days later, through six months later, we had 37% of our inventory in stock. We couldn't make it fast enough. We had people waiting on wait, waiting lists for six months. You know, on Twitter and social media, you know, they say, hey, you should remove your CEO. You guys know nothing about supply chain. Who the heck is running a company like this? I can't even buy underwear on your website. I'm gonna go somewhere else. And it was really frustrating because we had so many people coming into our website, but we didn't have enough product to sell. So about three of those months, I was on airplanes all over the world. I was going to Israel and Jordan and Egypt and China trying to make more product. But I think one of the biggest mistakes someone can make in my industry is making product but diluting the quality. And I think customer trust is really hard to get. And I think men are the hardest purchasers to change their mindset. I know my dad and some of my uncles have been wearing the same brands for 20 years. And to get them to change and try something else, you've got one shot. And if they love it, they love it, and they're typically a customer for life. If they don't like it, they'll probably never try you again. And as we grew, I knew maintaining quality was really important because you want people to be able to trust you and know what to expect. And it was one thing that we never sacrificed on is diluting the quality to meet demand. And I think we've all bought products from some brand or some company in the past, and all of a sudden it's made in a different country. It shrinks more, it doesn't fit the same. And for me as a customer, I would get really upset because I love something and two months later, the underwear style changed or the fabric changed. And I was like, why doesn't anyone make something consistent so I know what it's gonna be like, I can rely on it and I can trust it. So for those six months, fast forward to uh, the fall of 14, we finally got back in stock. And we had been planning and forecasting for all of our customers to buy it. You, you go to tommyjohn.com, select size medium, and you'd be emailed or notified when it came back in stock. And we planned and forecasted and bought into that and thinking everyone would buy one pair. Well, they came back and they bought an average of 3.2 pairs. So we went through our inventory three times faster than we were planning for, <laughs> which, it, which is something you really can't plan for either. But it, you know, so we ended up being stocked out again last fall. And we finally got back in stock and we over forecasted and we've been able to get our planning and forecasting in place in a position now to really uh, maintain the supply and demand of the business. And I think fast forward now, um, we're based in New York City and we looked at 2015, I really felt like we needed to grow up and, and <clears throat> what I mean by that is we needed to mature as a brand, kind of like when you go through puberty and you become, go from an adolescent to an adult your voice gets a little deeper. Um, but I, I really wanted to evolve and grow and make the brand as important as the product and really reflect on what's worked for us in the past and what hasn't worked. So we went through a whole brand deep dive and we changed our packaging and we changed our hang tags and we really wanted to elevate the experience. And I think for me, when you go into a men's department store as a guy, it can be really intimidating because you're looking at a bunch of guys without a shirt on. They probably had baby oil put on their eight pack of abs. And it's very un unrelatable, intimidating, and just a weird experience at the end of the day. For any guy or woman that's gone in there, there's, you know, Calvin Klein, for example, probably has five different, brand five different products with different fabrications and different price points. And guys grab the box and they turn it and they look so confused. And I thought, how do we reinvent this experience and make it more approachable, more relatable, and more comfortable? So we went away from having models on the packaging in their underwear. We only did it with undershirts. Uh, we, we created a whole different experience. And then we started looking at the underwear market. And the underwear market today is a $4 billion industry overall. Uh, underwear is a $2.9 billion part of that. And 
my feeling is I think underwear in me the men's underwear industry has probably evolved more in the last two years than the last 25. I don't think it had really changed much, in, much since the Marky Mark campaign in 1992. And I think when you look at everything in a guy's wardrobe, he upgrades his, sh his shoes, his watch, his vest, his technology. He'll go from a flip phone to an iPhone or a, you know, a typical TV to an HD flat screen. But his underwear is really still stuck in the dark ages. And for whatever reason, his wives or he himself are comfortable wearing underwear that has holes in it, that's crusty and yellow. And for whatever reason, he can get away with it. And I thought, how do we make this a better experience? How do we engage these guys that don't know or understand that underwear has changed? And in April of this year, there was a new study. And I talked earlier about 65% of men's underwear being bought by women. Today, today it's 36% of men's underwear is bought by women. Well, how does that happen? And I think when you look at the industry, there's more options for men today. Men are taking more ownership and responsibility of their clothes. They're enjoying the experience more. And they're shopping online more. They like the internet. They don't like driving to a store, trying to find a parking spot, waiting in line at the cash register. It's a lot easier to point, click, pay, and have your product show up a couple days later. So how are we going to take on these major players? And what are we going to do that's really unique and different? So we went through this whole branding process. And there's a lot of things that we didn't feel were being addressed in the men's underwear market. And I think for us, when you paint the picture of Tommy John, we're a premium brand, but we're not an unattainable brand. We're a premium and an approachable brand. And what I mean by that is we're comfortable talking about these uncomfortable truths, right? About it's a fact in life that guys get wedgies. It's a fact in life that they have to readjust themselves. It's a fact that their undershirts and underwear turn yellow. And there's some weird things that we were starting to notice in the market and in public and on subways and even on TV with, with celebrities and tennis players. And their underwear was uncomfortable. <laughs> they, they would have to shift around pull them down, pull them up. And I think when you look at underwear or undershirts, you know, a lot of guys were wearing baggy t-shirts, they're wearing baggy underwear. I don't think there's a woman in the audience that will wear a baggy bra. I don't think there's a woman in the audience that will wear baggy underwear. Why do guys do this? How do we make this, we call it an epidemic at Tommy John, but how do we make people more aware of this problem on the market? In a, in a not a weird, uncomfortable way, so we launched, we created a video. Has anyone seen our video called The Big Adjustment? A couple people. Uh, so we did this video uh, and it went viral. In the first week we had over a million views on YouTube and it talks about the, the uncomfortable things that guys do in public. Um, because we love our product, we did this. I'll try to see if it's gonna play with the, with the Wi-Fi. Carlton, Channel 2 Weather. But when you think you made it disappear, it comes again. I know I'm here and I've got thanks to my pants. I've got thanks to my pants. I've got thanks to my pants. So that's our video called The Big Adjustment. But I think what, you know, I talked about us being a relatable brand and an approachable brand. You know, you start off with the elderly couple in the first scene to the guy in war pulling out a wedgie, to the kids on the basketball court, to the teacher or the professor doing this. It doesn't matter what age you are, what you do for, for a profession, what race you are, it's a universal problem that we really wanted to highlight and make guys understand that there's a solution. And we ended up finding this amazing band called The Sparks, 
who had a song called Angst in My Pants. So could, there couldn't have been a more perfect song for the, the problem that we were trying to address through a message. Because I think if you look at traditional men's underwear advertising, typically it's a European, European soccer player or a tennis player that's put it on a billboard in Times Square, and it's really sold on sex. And I think in order for us to kind of become a challenger brand and create something new and different and kind of make fun of that, but also say, look, it's, I don't understand that. We want to make this relatable to you. We felt the video is a, was a way that we could get the point across about how uncomfortable you're making everyone feel because you're in uncomfortable underwear. And the solution is wearing comfortable underwear makes you comfortable in public and you don't have to do those things. So for us, it was a really successful campaign and it was really that maturation process that happened about a month ago. And as a result, that commercial that you saw is now part of a TV advertising campaign that you can see on ESPN and Fox and CBS and CNBC and Bloomberg News. And uh, there's always these things that you need to constantly do to keep the company evolving. And I think that's one thing we've always tried to do is learn from our mistakes, but also not be afraid to fail or change or be different. And I think that's one thing. I read this book, Purple Cow, and I, I think I'd rather die a purple cow than die a black and white cow, knowing that I did everything possible to give ourselves an opportunity to be different. And I think when you look at the great companies that I admire, they all took these calculated risks. And I think for us, we knew the market so bad, we felt that it needed something like this, and it's really continuing to allow our company to grow really quickly. So today, we're, we have 48 employees. We're based, we're three blocks south of Madison Square Garden in New York City. Um, I always talk about a startup, you know, we've been in business for seven years, but being in a startup or an upstart company is kind of like dog years, you know, one year for every seven years. So I feel like I've been there for about 49 years now. And it talks about the 10,000 hour rule. It certainly applies. And so I'm just going to show you guys a few pictures of the company, you know, at some company outings. Every November we do something called, we do a partnership with TCF, which is the Testicular Cancer Foundation, and where we give 5% of proceeds towards men's, uh, men's cancer awareness. The company is actually called Single Jingles for testicular cancer. And for every pair of underwear that we send out, they get a mustache in the pair of underwear, so you'll see people on social media, on Instagram and Facebook, tweeting pictures and posting pictures of mustaches. So even though we take our business very seriously, at the same time we try to have fun with it, because I think underwear is one of those things where it's too fun not to have fun with um, at the end of the day. So uh, that's the Tommy John story. So. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to give you, that's my family, that's my wife Erin and my daughter Violet. She's 11 months. And um, here's our website. There's my email, my Instagram. If anyone, any of the students want to reach out, um, feel free to reach out anytime. And thank you guys for having me. We have time for a few questions. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Any questions? Oh. Do you do any women's? I'm a little jealous that the guys get the no wedgie and the perfect <laughs> undershirt. No, so no women's. All the products that we create, whether it's underwear, undershirts, socks, t-shirts, long underwear, all were kind of concepted based on a problem that I had in the market that I felt needed to be solved. And when you look at women's, it's very crowded, it's a very saturated market. But we always talk about being very genuine and authentic, and I just haven't been comfortable enough to wear women's underwear to figure out what the problems are to solve. <laughs> 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 but ne never say never, maybe we will someday. The truth is stranger than fiction. A mile south of downtown Brookings was the purple cow drive-in. Was that a question? No. Uh, no. That, was, that was an FYI. Oh, so OK, OK. <laughs> Make sure you check that out. So what's next? Like, you found this huge, or this problem you had. You took it somewhere. Where are you going now, or what's your next step? as far as growth or categories or? Yeah. So, so our fastest growing piece of our business is our internet. 
our website. And I think more and more men are shopping online and buying. And I think for us, <clears throat> we always talk about really not having an ego. And I think for us, we've, we've gone from good to great in underwear, and now we're starting to extend out into wrinkle-free, pre-shrunk t-shirts and sweatpants and sweatshirts. And for us, when we go into a category, we want to make sure that we're, our product is functionally different. It solves a problem that our competitors may not be focusing on. So we can tell a story and really re relate to that guy and what he's wearing in his wardrobe. So for us, our biggest growth is there's still a lot of, a lot of people that don't even know who we are, even here in the US. Um, Canada is about 15% of our sales. Can Canada is a fast growing part of our business. Um, more and more customers are buying from other countries. We ship to about 40 countries across the world right now. So international is, is an opportunity that we'll probably focus on in 2017 a little more aggressively. But there's still a lot of opportunity here in the United States with Dillard's and Bloomingdale's, which are two new retailers that we're growing into. So those are, are what I would say our biggest growth opportunities are for, for the next probably three years. Biggest obstacle, I think, is is recruiting and finding talent and finding the right people for your business. I think uh, it's really tough to find. You know, we're still a small company or considered a small company in New York City, and you know, to get people to come over to a company that they're not familiar with, it requires a different mindset. And we always say hire slowly and fire fast. And I think that really resonates with me because you want to take time finding the right people. Um, but I would say culture is really important to us. And you, you know, we want people that work hard, they're ambitious, and they're able to roll up their sleeves past their elbow. And what I mean by that is they're willing to work hard and do things above and beyond what their job profile uh, describes. So they really have to have those check marks. And it's really tough because sometimes people have too much experience or they're too green or they want too much money or they read in TechCrunch at this company raised a bunch of money and they want options but they don't really want to work for it. So you really have to sift through and it, it's a lot of it's trial and error. I've learned I've made a ton of mistakes hiring people and hiring the wrong people and bringing them in but I think as you grow those sour apples you start seeing them a lot faster and the sour apples they always say spoil the bunch. It's certainly true. So you always have to be monitoring culture, and I think you can have the smartest, most talented person in the world, but if they don't fit into the culture, it never works. And I've really, something I struggled with the first couple years, and now, look, we're never perfect, but we're, it's something we're constantly always working on looking at. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yep. Say we have about seven. For our core products, underwear and undershirts, we went from one to three. That's a really great question because as you get bigger and bigger, you don't want to concentrate all of your supply chain in one manufacturer because we did a lot of our manufacturing in Egypt. If Egypt blows up or has political instability, it's a really tough position to be in. So I think the last since the supply chain issue happened, it's our COO always talks about having levers or backup plans. What's your plan B? What's your plan C? So now we're to the scale where we can't afford to have a disruption in our supply chain. So we're constantly second sourcing and third sourcing our components, our fabric, our packaging. So we always have a contingency plan as you scale. Um, in addition to that, we've actually gone down to the fiber source for our fabrics. So we know the fiber and what country it's made in and what knitting mill is knitting it. So we own and understand the whole supply chain from the start to the finish. So you control all of those ponds, so to say. Um, and that's been a, probably the biggest learning experience for the whole Howard Stern event, that tidal wave that hit us about a year and a half ago. All of them are offshore, so that's a great question. I, w one we get asked a lot is, why aren't you made in the USA? My answer to that question is, we were made in the USA, and as we scaled and grew, as you grow and scale, you're, you, you reach higher minimums, typically your price should go down as you reach those tiers. Our prices continue to go up. 
and quality continued to maintain, you know, be here. And when we looked overseas, we were able to get better pricing. We were able to actually get better quality, better sewing. And uh, the underwear market for men's had really kind of died off in the U.S. So we felt we could innovate faster, but also by outsourcing our production overseas, we were able to create more cash flow in the business. And the way I look at it is by doing that, we were able to create more jobs here in the U.S. as a result, as we grew. And I think one thing, talk about Craig, you know, entrepreneurs, and I think one thing is I think a lot of people sit on their couches and watch a lot of reality TV and think, gosh, I wish I did that or I wish I could do that. Wow, that would be nice. People move here from all over the world to be entrepreneurs, from India, from Spain, from Europe, and they start from nothing and they create businesses and convenience stores. In my opinion, there's no better country to be in and be an entrepreneur than the United States. And there's no better time to start a business than today because with the internet, anybody can start a business. It's never been easier in our lifetime. And I think what's so exciting about being here is it's this whole age of entrepreneurship has really started becoming bigger and bigger the last 10 years. And I think it's really exciting for South Dakota State to actually have this whole department focused on that. Because if I was a student 10, 10 or 15 years ago, I would have loved to have a speaker like this come in and tell a story like this. And I think that's why I do think these things is to kind of pay it forward because I'm no expert. I'm certainly not far from the smartest person in our company. And I figured this out along the way. I made a ton of mistakes and learned a ton. but. You know, it's not that bad living here, and it's not that hard starting in the business. Ask a lot of questions. Don't be afraid to network. Um, that's one thing I always did growing up in schools. I asked a lot of questions, and people look at me like, God, Tom, what is wrong with you? Tom Patterson asked probably the weirdest, oddest questions I've ever heard of any student. And it was, honestly, it was just because I was curious. I wanted to know. I wanted to learn. I wanted to understand. So that's one piece of advice. I, I would give all the entrepreneur students in here and anyone else that's you know thinking about starting a, uh, a business. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> How did you find that fabric, and do you test different fabrics all the time, or are you still using the very same fabric that you started with? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, when you look at women's lingerie and women's underwear, I think women's is probably 20 years ahead of men's. It's almost like that cartoon called the Jetsons. Uh, a lot of people of us probably watched. But you find me in a lot of women's lingerie and underwear departments if you come to New York City. And it's not because I have this weird fetish. The reason is I think their fabrics are much more evolved and much more innovative than men's. So I look at and get a lot of concepts and fabric references in women's lingerie, because I think you're starting to see a lot of men's clothing that's more form-fitting. Obviously, my pants are very fitted. A lot of men's products have spandex in them today, and there's a lot of advantages using fabrics that typically used to be feminine, so to say. We also attend a lot of fabric shows. We've hired fabric experts that work for the company that focus, we have an innovation team, They're entire job is focused on going across all over the world, going to these events and shows and working with manufacturers and trying to think up the next best fabric and what is going to be the next innovation that dries faster, that keeps you cooler, that doesn't um, wear out as quickly, that's more durable. So it's, you know, you always, I always say if you don't evolve, you dissolve. And I think that's our most competitive challenge is staying ahead of the game. And just because we've reached this plateau, we're working on products that we aren't even going to launch for two years. We just launched, has anyone heard of Tommy John Air? So Tommy John Air is the lightest men's underwear ever created. It weighs two ounces. You can wash it in the sink when you travel and it dries out in four hours. We worked on that product for over two years. I brought two pairs of underwear to China and Taiwan and Hong Kong and I wash them in the sink every night. And we'd weigh them and we'd put them in cups of water and figure out how fast they dried. So we do weird things like that and there's no book for how to do this stuff. We just like, all right, I think that's a good idea. Let's do that. So. I think by not having this experience in this industry made me really have no stereotypes about what to do or what the proper way is. And I think we always really try to challenge the status quo or question everything. Or why does it have to be that done that way? Why can't you take a fabric from a woman's lingerie or a woman's panty and make it into a men's product? And I think that's something that really works for us and we're continuing to try to evolve. Does that answer your question? 
All right, if you have any other questions for Tom, he'll be sticking around after. Don't forget that there is a social sponsored by the Brookings Inspired Group outside here. Sign up if you want more information, but please help me thank Tom again for his time and being here and sharing.